Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm Steve Long, and I'm so happy to have as my guest today my friend uh, Frank Lisiandro. Uh, by the time I get through with his complete biography, we'd be done, so let me just abbreviate this and say uh, Frank was uh, a lifelong filmmaker, an award-winning filmmaker, but uh, today we're here to talk a little bit about your writing and I think probably uh, emphasize maybe what you're best known for, at least lately, is your close association with Jim Morrison and The Doors and the books that you've written about him. So welcome, Frank. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. So I'm going to cheat just a little bit. And because I was uh, reading up on you, and I know you've been asked this before, but I think it's an interesting answer. Why do you think that so little has been written, at least accurately, about Jim Morrison? It seems to me that celebrities suffer the fate of headlines, and the more lurid the headline that the media can produce, the more uh, copies they're going to sell, the more advertising dollars they're going to attract. So uh, I would never want to be a celebrity. I wouldn't mind being rich, but um, <laughs> and anonymous and anonymous yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think Jim suffered that his life, and also he was totally misunderstood about what he was doing, especially on stage. He was trying to bring theatrics to the rock stage, which mm -hmm. really hadn't been done before. Maybe Frank Zappa tried it, or the Beatles tried it. But in America, it was uh, fairly unknown. And um, people thought that the character he played on stage was the character he was in real life. So right. when he portrayed the Lizard King on stage, which was a kind of a made-up sort of concept, mm -hmm. um, they thought that's what he was telling people, that he was the Lizard King. He wasn't telling people that. He was playing a part. He was a you know, he was a drama student, a film student at UCLA, uh, and uh, by, the, by the way, that's where you folks met. We met at yeah. UCLA. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to say, before I read your book, what I knew about Jim Morrison was not flattering. Uh, and in fact, this is close to the exact quote that that I heard: is that uh, he wasn't he he didn't care about being a musician as much as he cared about being a rock star. Uh, any comment? He didn't care at all about being a rock star. Right. He cared about being a writer, a poet. And so he figured out early that poetry was unread in America and that uh, if you were lucky and were a famous poet, you might sell a few hundred copies of a book. Mm -hmm. But that he, he understood that rock stars, or at least musicians, could present poetry, like Dylan was doing, uh, as songs. And so he determined to go in that route to uh, uh, to have his poetry exposed, to have his uh, his writing uh, accepted. And um, in the meantime, of course, he self-published books, his own writings. Um, sure. And um, <clears throat> whether he was successful at having his poetry accepted as poetry, being in a rock song or not, I, the the answer is still not clear about that. But he's surely getting better known as a poet now, um, and as a visionary. And near the end of his musical career, or what became the end, I think I remember reading that he, he wanted to go in that direction. He really would have just as soon stopped being a musician and started being an accepted poet. Is that accurate? Well, I don't know about accepted poet, but yes, he wanted to be a poet. And he left the band, he left the music scene. Um, uh, he fulfilled his contract with Electra Records. You know, his, his parents were uh, very middle class, uh, very establishment, taught him all those kinds of things about when you do a contract, make sure mm -hmm. you fulfill it. So he fulfilled his, his contract with Electra Records, produced the number of albums that he was supposed to produce, and um, decided to just leave the music scene. Maybe to come back, maybe to never again come back. Mm -hmm and to start looking into other areas that he was interested, other areas of creativity, which included filmmaking mm -hmm. and uh, writing. So uh, talk a little bit about the filmmaking. You guys worked on something together. Mm -hmm. Well, we worked on two films together. One was a kind of a loose documentary about the doors on the road in America in 1968-69. That's um, called Feast of Friends, and that's now available. It hadn't been available for 40-some-odd years, but last year uh, the doors decided to release the film as a film, and so that's available. Um, 
then Jim and I and a couple of other guys, the same crew that was on the Feast of Friends film, made Highway, which is an experimental film, um, imaginative, visionary film, um, followed the avant-garde sort of feelings in the 60s about making these kinds of different films. Um, very little uh, continuous narrative. Um, and that film has not been released. And uh, hopefully it will be released someday soon. Okay. So when, uh, if I follow the description, are those snippets? Are they little vignettes? Are they... No, it's a complete, um, it's a complete 50 minute film. 52 minutes, I believe. But does it hang together then, if, if there's not a through it line? It depends on the audience. Uh -huh. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, uh, if, if you bring imagination to any creative uh, product, whether it be a film or a poem or a song, if you bring your own imagination and your own participation and get involved because the work is provoking that involvement, then surely you will, you will enjoy it as a unity. Uh, okay. But if you expect it to be um, a Hollywood film or a TV drama, then I think you'll be disappointed. Okay. And I think that you told me one time that, that is it the PBS had uh, American Masters, I think it used some footage that, that you shot or, or you shot together? Mm -hmm. What, uh, and I think that you were not pleased, if I remember. Well, they decided to use some of the film from the highway, some of the, they call them outtakes, but they weren't really outtakes, some of the scenes from highway, and put it in this documentary they were making about Jim. Well, the documentary started out with false intentions, that they were using footage from someone else's film without uh, accreditation, uh, without even describing what this, these scenes were about. A lot of the audience said, oh, that's an actor playing Jim Morrison in this film. And it actually was Jim playing the role he played in Highway. Yeah. And so, and there was no explanation of that throughout the entire film. Um, and the documentary was poor in the sense that it was um, obvious. All the obvious bad boy mannerisms that Jim okay. displayed and, and very little about poetry, uh, very little about the times he lived or his accomplishments. It reminds me of a, uh, what they call a reality show when you shoot a lot of footage and then you can extract from that what you, 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 you can set a direction by how you edit it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's what they've done. Essentially, they, um, they didn't know what they were doing. And they asked for my help as a, uh, as a consultant. And, you know, I think I steered the film a little bit away from the sensational, but... Um, they had this notion that they were going to present this guy as a raging lunatic, creative artist, yes, but raging lunatic, and he was hardly ever that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was unfortunately an alcoholic and uh, suffered from the usual kind of behavior patterns of alcoholics. Um, was never diagnosed as an alcoholic, but had all the tendencies, the sure. behavioral problems of an alcoholic, and drank every day of his life. Sure. So one of the things about my book, Jim Morrison, Friends Gathered Together, is that I decided to talk to his friends about him, to, to kind of uh, contest the kind of notion that was uh, being presented by the media that people had of him, and talk to a couple of dozen or how many I could gather, 20 of his friends, and say, let's talk about Jim. This was about 20 years after he died. Mm -hmm. And um, he, all of these people were in some way involved with him on some sort of basis. Uh, they were friends, lovers, uh, workmates. They mm -hmm. were in, in the business, in the, you know, the, the uh, music business. They were producers, um, promoters. And they all spoke very frankly about the guy, and not putting a halo on him. And so I compiled all of these uh, interviews into this book. You know what struck me about this is <clears throat> clearly these are transcribed interviews. The, the voices are different. You really get to know the speaker. But there's an amazing consistency when you strip away um, maybe an individual experience or, or something like that. At the core of it, it, there's a very consistent view of Jim and I think very it's not varnished, but it's, but it's complimentary in the sense that he seemed just like a nice person, a, a generous person. 
He was uh, both nice and generous, very kind. Um, he, um, he grew up with good Southern manners, as I was trying to say before, you know, come, came from a middle class family. Uh, his father was in the military. Um, he was um, an astounding, really, human being. Um, mm -hmm. His gentleness and, and generosity were um, noteworthy. I was going to get to the military father, <clears throat> and I wanted to ask about this. Do you think Jim's behavior in any way was a reaction to a disciplinarian, or would he have been, Jim was Jim, sort of regardless? I don't see how any human being can uh, put aside his upbringing, his family life. I mean, that's part of the pattern of who we are. And surely Jim uh, was, um, he had a father who was a disciplinarian, a father who became an admiral in, in the Navy, and uh, uh, he lived under that, uh, that regime of discipline. And he, here, here he was, this very creative, um, very independent soul, uh, having to live for the first 15 years of his life, 16 years of his life in a family that um, didn't necessarily march to dinner or to church, but right. they were well disciplined. Well, and I think the times too. I mean, this was a military father in really a, a military colored time. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And, I, and I can't imagine uh, a, a greater distance between father and son than what Jim seemed to represent and certainly what his father represented. In fact, there was a great difference. There was a big uh, divide, a big gap between uh, Jim and his family. And, and he, uh, he evidenced that in, in, in terms of uh, his career and where he didn't want them to be involved in his career. He, mm -hmm. he tried to spare them um, because his father was in the military and he didn't want the, the, uh, the taint of the rock and roll life sure. to then reflect on the family. So sure. uh, he didn't acknowledge them uh, during his uh, music career. Frank, we've only got about a minute, but I, I didn't want to let you go without asking. I know you're working on something else. Uh, you showed me a sort of, is it a treatment, uh, an outline of a, of a film that you hope to make? Yes, I'm, I've finished uh, an outline of a documentary film um, about tribute bands in Italy. Mm -hmm. And there's a phenomenon of tribute bands in Italy right now. Uh, there's probably... I can't even estimate, 400, 600 tribute bands covering all of the famous bands from England and the United States. And this phenomenon is really interesting uh, in the sense that it's a sociological kind of thing where all these young musicians want to be somebody. There's not enough stage presence for them to be original artists all the time. Mm -hmm. But there's always an audience for the Kinks or the Rolling Stones or ACDC or sure. Led Zepp. So uh, they go out and play their music. But it's also an entree, is, is that right? In other words, the, some of those bands might morph into or, or start to, to record or play their own original music. Um, when you're young, you start out by copying somebody, sure, whether it's Mozart on a classical piano right. or the chef who came before you at the restaurant. Right. And these musicians are copying the best, the people that they like the most. And uh, they, uh, they're very dedicated to that. It's a, I think it's a uh, fascinating subject, and, ho and I hope to make an interesting film out of it. Yeah, and I know that you encountered that uh, on a recent book tour uh, in Italy. Yes, I, so. I did encounter that. I encountered yeah. uh, four different bands that represented the Doors, and uh, each one of them was excellent. Uh, they were outstanding. Um, mm -hmm. And I began to develop this idea talking to them and talking to other musicians in Italy uh, okay. about that. You got to come back because we're not nearly, <laughs> we scratched the surface on what you're up to, but we are nearly out of time. So I want to uh, invite people to contact me if you have an idea for a guest, for a topic. Uh, you can do that through my website, stephenwlong.com. And uh, Frank, you've got, uh, I know, a Facebook page. Yes. You, you want to mention that? Uh, I have a Facebook page. I really. <laughs> I really go on it, but um, people can contact me uh, through uh, the publisher of the book, okay. uh, visionwordsandwonder.com, okay. and the book is available at the Vortex here in town. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's The Writing Life.